Um, bienvenidos, bienvenidas. Welcome to the Inter-American Dialogue uh, for today's discussion on breaking the cycle of violence against children in Honduras and El Salvador. Uh, my name is Michael Camilleri. I direct the Rule of Law program here. Uh, we're very pleased uh, to welcome for this discussion three distinguished panelists. Um, to my immediate left, Rachel Dodson is uh, Senior Director of Gender and Migration Initiatives at Con Kids in Need of Defense, KIND, uh, which represents unaccompanied immigrant and refugee children in their deportation proceedings. Uh, KIND also promotes in countries of origin, transit, and destination durable solutions to child migration that are grounded in the best interests of the child and ensure no child is forced to involuntarily migrate. Uh, to Rachel's left, Daniela Ligiero is Executive Director and CEO of Together for Girls, uh, which is a partnership that aims to raise awareness, promote evidence-based solutions, and galvanize coordinated action across sectors to end violence against boys and girls with a special focus on sexual violence against girls. Uh, and finally, uh, needs no introduction, Manuel Orozco, um, my uh, colleague here at The Dialogue who directs our migration remittances and development program. Uh, so uh, three uh, fantastic panelists, each of whom brings a unique uh, set of expertise and perspective uh, to this issue. Uh, so we'll spend the next hour or so exploring with them the magnitude, the causes, uh, and the consequences of violence against children in the Northern Triangle, uh, as well as the necessary policy responses uh, to this challenge. Uh, so I'm going to begin by asking each of the, the panelists to offer some initial reflections uh, from their perspective and that of their organizations and their work, uh, after which we'll engage in a conversation and we'll leave time at the end for your questions. Um, so Rachel, if I can start with you. Uh, welcome again and the floor is yours. Thank you. Is it, can you hear me? Is that right? Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here today, and thanks so much for hosting this conversation on such an important topic. Um, so I'll start by talking just a little bit about the context for KIND's involvement in these issues. Um, <clears throat> so Kids in Need of Defense provides legal services for unaccompanied migrant children. Um, we have uh, offices in 11 cities in the U.S., and we work with thousands of migrant children every year. Um, we also work really closely with partner organizations in Mexico and Central America on advocacy and programming, and in Guatemala and Honduras on return and reintegration programming for returning migrant children. Um, so through our work with these organizations, um, we've become, in our, in our own legal services work in the US, we've become aware of um, the high levels of migrant children who are fleeing from Central America um, who are affected by sexual and gender-based violence. Um, so this is especially girls and LGBTIQ youth, but not only. Um, and they're fleeing their countries to escape these forms of violence, but in many cases, they're also experiencing sexual violence in, in transit as well. Um, and these children are arriving in the US or in Mexico with urgent needs, both for international protection and also for other forms of support, for example, medical, specialized medical and um, mental health services as well. Um, so in 2016, in order to learn a little bit more about this issue, we did some research on sexual and gender-based violence and child migration. Um, we did interviews with migrant children in Central America and Mexico, as well as with government officials and representatives of civil society. And we found that um, sexual and gender-based violence is a major driver of child migration um, and that um, from Central America, um, especially for girls and LGBTIQ youth, um, and we also found that some of the most common forms of sexual and gender-based violence that we documented through our research were child sexual abuse, gang-based sexual violence, human trafficking, and hate-motivated violence against LGBTQI youth. Um, <clears throat> we were just, to give an example, we were just in Honduras um, on a fact-finding trip, and we were um, looking at issues of violence against children and youth, and we spoke to a family of an adolescent girl who had been kidnapped and raped by a gang and returned to her home the, day, the next day, left at her home, and she and her family knew that she would be targeted again, that she wouldn't be safe staying there, so she immediately fled the country. Um, and these are the, the stories that we hear all over and over again and how we understand this connection between forced child migration and sexual and gender-based violence. The prevalence rates for these types of violence are extremely hard to obtain because of severe underreporting. But we know from our research and from our direct work with children and youth that these are very widespread forms of violence. 
Um, and we also know that it's not just these forms of violence that cause forced child migration, but it's also the inability and unwillingness of Central American governments to protect um, and provide justice to, to survivors of violence. Um, this includes factors that, that drive this include weak judicial and child protection systems that are also ex extremely underfunded, widespread corruption, uh, the power of gangs and other organized criminal groups, and the normalization of gender-based violence and the lack of prioritization within judicial systems and other areas of government. Um, and all of these leads to the lack of justice and protection that lead um, children to be forced to migrate. Um, so referring again to Honduras, because we were just there for this, um, for this trip, um, for, we heard from so many civil society organizations that work directly with children and youth that they have been unable to obtain responses from DNAF, the child protection system, in cases where they have reported children being at high risk for violence, um, especially when gangs are involved, because in many cases it's not even safe for child protection authorities to go into the communities where children live. Um, so to confront these forms of violence um, in partnership with organizations in the region, we launched what we call gen our Gender and Migration Initiative at KINDS. So that includes research, advocacy, and programming um, to prevent sexual and gender-based violence against migrant children, and also to advocate for increased protection, increased services for children who are survivors. And we also continue to represent children who are survivors of sexual and gender-based violence in their immigration cases in the United States. Um, so just to close up, I would just say that the situation is, is, is dire. Um, it's a really important issue, and that the only way that we're going to be able to um, make change in this area is through government, civil society, and international organizations really prioritizing um, violence prevention and strengthening responses for survivors. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Daniela. Sorry, there we go. Yes, hi. Thank you so much for that, Rachel. Thank you so much for hosting us today. It's such a pleasure to be with, with you all today and to see lots of uh, familiar faces um, as well as some new ones. So, you know, I want to talk a little about violence um, at large. The, the study of violence is a relatively new thing. You know, for centuries, we have believed globally that violence just is and that it's something that you have to learn to live with and it's part of human nature and it just happens. Um, but in the last century, we've seen something amazing, which is levels of violence worldwide compared to what we've seen over several millennia have really actually decreased. Um, today, for the first time in human history, more people die of suicide than of homicide. And that includes all kinds of violent crime, including the kinds of homicide that, and, and violent crime that happen within war settings, terrorism combined. That's the first time in history we've had that. So we've actually seen that violence can be prevented and that you can actually decrease violence. And we understand that through things like rule of law and changing social norms and a lot of different kinds of interventions, we've seen violence in a lot of settings go down. However, there's still these pockets of places that continue to be extremely violent, um, whether it's in communities or entire countries or regions, and those have persisted, as well as certain types of violence. Like, for example, violence against women is something that continues to persist globally, certain types of violence against children, et cetera. And so one of the really exciting things that's happened really in the last decade or so is actually thinking about violence a little bit like a disease and applying a public health approach to violence. So if you think of violence as something that can be passed from one generation to the next, something that can be contagious around among groups, um, and if you use a public health approach, we found that you can actually decrease violence and contain it in ways that we didn't know previously were possible. And a public health approach basically means doing a couple of things. One is you go in, like if you think of an epidemic, you go in, you need to study it. You need to understand it. What are the risk factors, the protective factors? Where is it happening? Times of day, perpetrators, victims. Um, you know, really go in and understand what is happening, mapping it out. Once you have that, then what you need to do is to actually test, develop and test interventions and to see what works, 
to change the transmission, the expansion, and the continuation of violence. And then finally, whatever it is you find works, you need to scale. You need to bring that to scale. Um, and so I work at Together for Girls, and we are a public-private partnership that has been around for 10 years. We just celebrated 10 years. Several of our partners um, include UN agencies like UNICEF, WHO, UNAIDS. US government is a really important partner of ours, Canada, as well as the governments around 22 countries around the world and private sector organizations. And we apply a public health approach to ending violence against children and youth with special attention to sexual violence and to gender issues. And the way we do that is we always start by understanding the problem. So we've worked with the US Centers for Disease Control to do these massive national surveys of violence against children and youth that look at every form of violence, that look at times of day, locations, perpetrators, first time, last time, location, and really give you, for the first time in the countries where we've worked, a comprehensive snapshot of violence. And this is kind of all forms of violence and how they're interconnected. And then we use those data to support national governments and partners to implement evidence-based programs to respond to whatever the issues are in that particular country. Um, and we started off in Sub-Saharan Africa um, and doing a lot of work there and just very recently moved to Latin America, which to me personally has been a real commitment. And so we just completed these very large household national surveys of violence against children and youth in El Salvador and Honduras. If you walked in, maybe you saw some fact sheets that you can pick up. There's also the much bigger study if you're interested. All of this is available online. And then Colombia will be launching uh, later this year. But the idea is that we now understand, for the first time in these countries, I mean, we've had research, you mentioned some research that looks at specific pocket, pockets and communities and populations, but nothing ever that looks at comprehensively what's happening nationally. And so I think now we really have an opportunity to use these data to, to help us inform the implementation and the scale up of evidence-based programs that we know work to prevent violence. And I, I hope I can talk a little bit more about the results, but just to give you a sense, we added a whole piece to this survey related to migration. And we worked with IOM because we understand that these issues are so interrelated. And in addition to finding you know, the significant issues you mentioned around children migrating and violence experienced along that mag migratory journey, one of the striking things we found is that when a parent migrates, whether it's a mother or a father, the child that stays is actually much more vulnerable to violence and various forms of violence. So the intersection between migration and violence is actually very complex, and there's this destabilizing of families, of communities that happens along the migratory process and because of migration um, that we also need to think about in terms of the people who stay. Um, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about the results later, but that's, these are just some opening thoughts. Thank you so much. Terrific. Thank you, Daniela. We'll definitely get into to the results of those surveys. Uh, Manuel. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, vi violence, we understand, is as, a, as an act of transgression that has an effect on um, causing injury, physical or emotional, on an individual. Most of the time, um, or until recently, is non-consensual. Uh, the, the exercise of, of this transgression. Um, I come from a society, I was born in Nicaragua uh, in the 1970s. Well, I'm an X generation, borderline baby boomer. But uh, uh, let's say I'm X generation. Um, and I, mean, I grew up with bullying in the streets, uh, in school. Um, then in the, in the 1980s, in a society with what uh, lived in, in a culture of violence where we were exposed to repression on a regular basis by a dictatorship, uh, the Somoza dictatorship in the 1970s. And then we were exposed to the civil war. We, uh, when I was, I, I learned to use a gun at, at eight, an M16 when I was 14, and how to avoid uh, getting your fingers stuck with the bullets. Um, and we had to hide to avoid the, the National Guard coming, coming to recruit you uh, or to kill you. Part, being part of the student movement was a threat. 
Um, paradoxically, today, being part of a student movement in Nicaragua is still a threat. Um, 40 years later. Um, and then in the, I, I left, I'm a product of the Cold War. I left Nicaragua in 83, came to Costa Rica, went to Costa Rica, and then came to the US. Um, and throughout all this time, as an ad, I, I was exposed to all these forms of, of structural violence, what Johan Gal Galton talks, uh, structural violence. Um, in, as an adult in college, I, I worked uh, on issues relating to youth gangs, um, reducing youth gang violence, helping the guys who were trying to get out of gangs uh, not to be hurt. Uh, this was in the late 90s. And I, I worked with three children in Guatemala uh, who were sniffing glue through a, a company that marketed HP Fueler, that's uh, marketed basically the glue to kids in Guatemala so that they could make money. But the, the, one of the consequences of it was the widespread abuse, violence against the street children uh, in the cities, in Guatemala City in particular. And then comes 2000, and w one of the areas that we start dealing with is not just migration in general, but unaccompanied minor migration. We, one of the, the studies we did in 2014 was to do a municipal level analysis where we found that there was a strong correlation between the locations of highest homicide rates in the Northern Triangle and unaccompanied minor migration. Um, and uh, in a study we just did uh, with uh, collaborative work with Creative Associates, we, we found that one in four Central Americans, Northern Triang people from the Northern Triangle, wanted to migrate um, from the region. But what was interesting was that 32% um, of those who wanted to migrate with their children had been exposed to at least one form of crime, of victimization. Um, the percent was higher than uh, people who wanted to migrate by themselves. I mean, in all of the cases, there is a strong correlation with violence. But with those who wanted to migrate in, uh, with their children, the extent of having experienced violence was uh, much higher, was three times higher. So uh, with all this, what we see uh, you know, from a personal as well as from a, from a professional point of view, um, the culture of violence in Central America continues. And what we actually see is that it has actually become exacerbated, partly because the, the context in which we are, where there is a, a very powerful transnational organized crime network operating in the region, but also because the, the fragility of the state system in these countries is not capable, is not able to really provide any services available to people. And there is, a, I think there is a, um, something that I probably will elaborate later in the, in the discussion. I think that the, at, at the core of this issue, there is a problem of the culture of violence. The, the definition, the, the, the norm setting of what does it masculinity means on the one hand. On the second hand, we have, uh, on, not on the one hand because we have three. Um, <laughs> One is the, the concept of masculinity. Two is the, our political culture that um, favors coercion over consent. And third, um, a very poor sense of solidarity. And those three factors are responsible for a lot of the continuity of this exercise of violence. So I'm, I'm going to stop uh, here and then Follow up. Great, thanks, Manuel. I think that's um, uh, we have a, a, a range of, I think, perspectives and, and issues we've identified for for a conversation. So, thank you all for those uh, initial thoughts, um, Daniela. Maybe I'll come back to you to, uh, to delve into those surveys a little bit because they do. It is sort of a rich trove of data about um, violence against children in, in these two countries in the Northern Triangle. So, can you tell us a little bit about? You know, uh, I know they're they're big studies, um, but if you could summarize for us, you know, what maybe what surprised you, what stands out uh, when we think about uh, the factors uh, generating violence uh, in Honduras and El Salvador, uh, what should we take away from the the work that you've all done in the region? Hello. You know, and I will not do this justice because there are they are very big. So if you're interested, go go and look. Um, a couple of things I want to flag. One is this really interesting relationship that I started to talk about between violence and migration. And 
you know, the finding that people absolutely are migrating because of violence. Um, so there's that really comes out. The fact that when especially a parent in a household migrates, the children that stay are much more likely to experience violence, I think is a really important finding. Um, but one of the things that I think really struck me, and I'll go back to what you said, Manuel, because I, I absolutely believe in it. There are, you know, weak institutions, and we know this from around the world. When you have weak institutions coupled with social norms that normalize violence um, and justify the use of violence, um, that's not a very good combination. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about norms around masculinity. One of the things that really shocked us is that in every other country we've surveyed, what we usually find is that girls tend to experience more sexual violence and boys tend to experience more physical violence. But in El Salvador and Honduras are the only two countries today, and we have data for 10% of the world's population under 24 at this point. These are the only two countries where girls experience mo more of both kinds of violence. So there's something there that's happening around masculinity, you know, and, and the norms. And believe me, I'm, I'm originally from Brazil, so I, I also understand kind of where this comes from, you know, the, the, the patriarchy and kind of really at a level for girls. And it's also true, of course, that these are places with very high levels of femicide. So it, but femicide doesn't just happen. It starts early in terms of the devaluing and the violence that these girls are experiencing, and then it continues. So you have to nip that early on if you really want to stop femicide. The other thing that shocked me was, you know, in most cases we find high levels of sexual violence. I like to talk about sexual violence as one of the largest hidden pandemics of our time. I mean, you have Me Too exploding in this country and everywhere in the world, more and more people are coming for. Sexual violence, harassment, abuse is happening everywhere. Um, and so what we usually find when we do the surveys is that for the first time, you can actually see these percentages at a population level. And so, you know, it's not surprising that high levels of both boys and girls experience sexual violence in both of these countries, um, anywhere from about 20 to 30 percent of children in a country, in a country, okay? Um, but in Honduras, for example, we found that the main perpetrator of sexual violence against girls is a family member. So, you know, we sometimes think of, I think, it's very easy when you're reading the papers to think about the violence that is happening, that gets visibility in Honduras and El Salvador, the gangs, the, the violence that happens outside the home. That is really important and critical for us to think about. But as you said in your story, what we find is that all these forms of violence actually begin to interconnect. And there's actually a lot that's happening in homes that, you know, is a reflection of this broader ecosystem that needs to be addressed. And what is that about? We've also never seen that in any other country that we've surveyed. We've always seen family members perpetrate violence. This is at a level of 70% or more of the girls are saying that the first experience of sexual violence that they had was actually with a family member. Um, again, some of the things that I think we need to think about and that are important for us to program, we find that most people have very generic perspectives based on what they read in the paper around what's happening with violence. And our firm belief is that unless you look at the data, you're not going to know where to intervene. Um, and that what ha is happening in Honduras is very different, for example, from what we saw in Swaziland. Um, for example, in Honduras and El Salvador, we found that there's violence happening in the school, but actually the school is the safest place for kids nowadays in these countries, whereas in other countries, the school is actually a very unsafe place. And so the programming is going to look very different depending on, on what the data is. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, Rachel, um, is this consistent? I mean, you're, you're looking at this not from a you know, the, the kind of macro um, kind of big data perspective, but on a case-by-case, victim-by-victim basis, representing um, many of the individuals um, that would have been reflected in, in the statistics that, that Daniela mentioned. So, I mean, is this consistent with your experience? You mentioned the issues of underreporting, um, the, the sort of uh, complex and, and, and um, kind of multi-factor and, and, and multiple sort of expressions of violence that uh, that a lot of uh, the, the children you're representing 
um, are subjected to. So maybe just can you reflect on uh, on some of the trends that, that Danielle mentioned from the perspective of Kind's work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's extreme. It's very consistent um, in terms of forms of violence, in terms of, in, in terms of sort of the factors driving this violence. So we both in our research, in our work directly with migrant children in the U.S., many of whom have fled violence, and then also working with partner organizations in Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, we found that along with gang-based sexual violence, um, violence in the home and family, including sexual violence, is one of the main forms of violence and a major driver of child migration. Um, so we also are are very concerned about and have seen the factors of normalization of violence um, that have been mentioned, but also the ways in which impunity play out in family-based violence because of fear of disclosure. We found that in many cases when children talk to an adult, um, in many cases children don't talk to an adult because they're afraid, because they don't have confidence that they will be believed or heard. When children do talk to an adult about sexual violence in the family, in many cases they aren't believed, they're blamed for what happened, um, they aren't encouraged or supported in reporting. And then in those few cases where an adult does help a child, or the very few cases where a child is able to go alone to report violence to police um, and is able to sort of start a judicial process, um, there are so many barriers, uh, including discrimination within um, within the police and the judicial system, within the child protection system. Um, they aren't believed. Um, and these kinds of cases are just not prioritized and they're not given the resources they need in terms of protection. So they're, so even after you're telling an adult about what happened, they're still facing violence. They're still unprotected. Um, so we're seeing that in, in many cases. Manuel, I want to pick up with you the, the, these issues of sort of culture and, and masculinity and some of the themes that have come out. I, I guess, um, when we, when we start to sort of pivot the conversation towards what can be done, um, you're pointing to some factors that, that are pretty deep rooted um, and um, exist presumably side by side with some of the more kind of proximate causes of violence, the gangs and the organized crime and, um, you know, uh, things that are happening within families and so on. Um, but, but when we think about um, those deeper issues um, and how those might, might be addressed. Can you say a little bit more about kind of what you're getting at and, and how we, um, how those should be incorporated into the conversation about um, addressing these these challenges? Uh, you talk about the normalization of violence. I, I mean, to, to me, the, it's always being okay. Um, I think the Okay, I, I teach a class on Central America, and one of the issues I, I uh, violence is acceptable. Um, the exercise of violence in one of the elements that informs social norms in Central America historically has been what I call the Trinity or the three Ps: el padre de la iglesia, el padre de la patria, y el padre de la familia. At the core of these three elements of this Trinity is the, cons the consensus that subordination of women uh, is given. Number two, that the use of force over consent is acceptable. It is, in fact, good parenting, good governing, and good ruling. It's about administering force. It's not about governance. And when the democratic transitions started in Central America in the 19, uh, 19, late 80s, early 90s, um, the effort to establish a democratic political culture uh, clashed with this uh, Trinitarian culture, set of beliefs. And even today, we're dealing with those issues. Um, and, you know, the revelations of Oscar Arias' sexual abuse, for example, it's like everybody knew about it. I knew, we all knew, and, and I've been working on, in, with, um, since the, 19, late, the late 1990s, you know. Um, but there is an issue of permissibility, and that's what I'm getting at, that the, the conception, the, the notion of masculinity as a belief that males have certain attributes that relate to strength, force, 
um, and subordination in a hierarchic context, it's something that has been transferred over time on a cultural basis. But more importantly, is that to be a man is to be someone who um, subordinates to, is on top of someone. And, and perhaps that, that explains why you find, for example, um, some of the data interesting and different from other places because, um, you know, this actually, this is something that came out in 2000 by another Brazilian, I think, no, it was a Colombian writer, I forgot her name, um, who say that there was a lot of uh, violence against men, uh, sexual violence against men, uh, being more of a widespread process. And what it turns out is that in order to exercise your absolute masculinity, you need to dominate another man sexually, not just a, a woman. But the, the pattern of, of, of these uh, practices becomes so deep rooted that uh, with the context of state fragility, um, you have transnational organized crime networks that find an easy opportunity to operate within the context of uh, gun handling, force, coercion, etc. Uh, and so it becomes fertile territory. So the, the, the solution of the issue becomes even more formidable, more, more challenging, uh, because I don't think it's about establishing a risk prevention program, for example. This is not about risk. We're past risk. Um, uh, that, that if, if you're talking about acceptable, violence as something acceptable, violence as the normal, therefore you have to attack normality, not address risks. And from a programmatic point of view, this requires a structural different type of intervention. It also brings into question the issue of child migration and asylum policies in the United States. We are actually going against the tide uh, on these issues, just at a turning point when um, violence in the region is basically systemic. That is, it affects children and as well as adults. Um, in the study we did, uh, um, on migration, on the determinants of migration. Yes, we found that violence against youth was much higher, uh, especially among those who wanted to migrate. 18% um, of people who wanted to migrate and had been physically abused um, were people under 30. It was a much higher percentage than uh, anyone, but that's two in 10. I mean, it's like if, if you look, if you think in terms of your neighborhood, it means at least one person in the block in La Cuadra um, has been uh, abused in some form. Thanks, Manuel. I want to come back to the the link to migration, but um, maybe to stay on the on the on the interventions point with Daniela. I mean, you, I think, uh, very succinctly. Kind of outlined what needs to happen, which is you need to understand the problem, you need to test interventions, and then you need to scale the ones that work. Where are we? <laughs> uh, you know, in, in, in terms of that three step process, you know, what, what, where do we stand now? What needs to happen? Well, this is perfect because it also addresses, I think, the comment you made about risk, and I wanted to jump in on that. You know, the good news is that although this is a relatively new field of study around violence prevention and response, um, especially when you're looking at, at children and youth. Um, we do have, over the last two decades, quite a lot of evidence that's accumulated from around the world. And just to be really clear, when I talk about risk and testing interventions and scaling them, I, I use that very, very broadly. Um, and to give you a sense of, of where we are and how we're thinking about risk protective factors and interventions, we just underwent and finished last year a very painful exercise, but a very needed <laughs> exercise, which is 10 big global agencies came together. The World Bank, um, USAID, UNICEF, the World Health Organization, us, several others. And we actually looked at what is all the evidence that exists on what works to prevent violence against children. What actually works? Because people have a million programs that look pretty on paper or sound good, but you know, unless you test them again, we're very data driven. You know, what is the what is the effect of doing certain things? And we actually were able to kind of package this um, in something that'll be easy to remember. Um, and I encourage you to look at it as well. And it's called Inspire. 
the fact that we all agreed was the miracle because we all have our own perspectives and these are big institutions. But inspire is actually, each letter is a strategy and it sounds for the seven strategies that we today know work to actually prevent and reduce violence. The first I in inspire is the implementation and the enforcement of laws. And so all of the issues related to rule of law and institutions and how they work, that is actually critical. So when I think of risk, I'm, we're, this is like the broader sense of how we're thinking about that. That has an impact. The N in inspire is changing norms, changing social norms, some of the ones you described, some of the ones you described and I described, is, is all really important. And there are lots of ways in which we found that you can start to change norms. You can actually, you know, norms change over time. I mean, a hundred years ago, we didn't think, you know, that child labor was an issue. And today we think it's, you know, in this country that it's not a good idea for kids to be working and they should go to school, right? Or smoking, or think of the things, the norms we've been able to change just in our lifetimes. Um, S of INSPIRE stands for safe spaces. We found it's really important to create these pockets of safety for children and youth where they can play, where they can interact um, in a nonviolent way, in a safe way. Um, P is parenting. We found that parenting programs can be extremely effective in terms of the intergenerational transmission of violence. One of the most important risk factors for boys in terms of perpetrating violence is actually witnessing violence in their home. So it's a way of, you know, intervening. Um, R is response. So everything that has to do with response services, you touched on this. When, when someone comes forward, what is there in terms of the system, the child protection system, the response system um, within police, then the judicial, et cetera, for victims? And finally, E is education. What you can do to educate people, including in schools, but more broadly, you know, education initiatives. So, you know, there is stuff that works and that we know works. And what really we found that was I think most important is that it's not just one of these strategies. There's no one thing that you're gonna do. You actually have to come in and do all of it. Um, and, and really, each one of these kinds of strategies will have one kind of impact, but when you put them together, the impact is really magnified. So at the end of the day, the news is good in the sense that we know now a lot more about what needs to be done. The challenge is, of course, doing it, scaling it, and that's all about political will, about financial resources, and about making this a priority. On that same point, um, Rachel, I think you said in your initial intervention that there needs, it needs to be prioritized. On, on the question of um, political will, um, I take it you're referring both to the, um, the governments themselves in, in Central America and the Northern Triangle, but also um, perhaps the international community. Uh, we know the United States has had some, um, some different views on, on assistance to uh, to Central America in recent years. Um, can you say a little bit more about what prioritization looks like from Kind's perspective? Absolutely. Um, so I think that a couple of areas need to be prioritized. Um, response, precisely the response that's available, the types of support that are available, the types of protection that are available it's for people who come forward, for children and youth who come forward and have experienced violence, but also prevention is a huge priority, obviously. Um, and I think from what we've learned, we do sexual and gender-based violence prevention programming in Guatemala and Honduras and high migration areas. And we really look at the aspect of norms and looking at um, gender equity programming, masculine, programming on new masculinities um, for children, for youth, for families, teachers, communities. Um, and some of the aspects that we really see as important there are that the responses are really coming from and being driven by organizations grounded in the local communities that know what the issues are. Um, and then the question then is how these programs can be scaled, how they can reach more children, how they can reach more areas. Um, so in terms of um, prioritizing protection, um, as you mentioned, um, the U.S. government has had a role in the past um, and ha continues to have a role in funding some really important programming in Central America. Um, we were just, as I mentioned, in Honduras, and we met with um, an organization there that does programming. They received funding from, U from USAID um, to do gang violence prevention programming in communities, um, working with providing counseling in homes to youth, to families, to prevent that involvement in the first place. Um, and that's just one example of some of all of the amazing programming that we've seen, and we've worked directly. We've worked directly with the organizations that are implementing this, um, and we really see that U.S. government continuing support for this programming that prevents violence, including sexual and gender-based violence, also gang violence, 
at the local level is essential. So without supporting this, without providing funding for this type of programming, we're not going to be able to provide children with alternatives to forced migration. So obviously, this is a responsibility of regional governments, something that governments in all three Central American countries need to be investing in, but also something that it, the US government needs to continue to support. Terrific. Manuel, I'd welcome your thoughts as well on, on the U.S. policy piece of this. Um, but I also wanted to ask you about the, the migration question um, in, in two ways. One of the um, kind of striking data points, I thought, from the, the surveys uh, was the correlation between um, uh, parents migrating and, and uh, victim, violence victimization. Um, so maybe you c can you sort of take us behind the, the data and try to sort of uh, flesh out what, what you think is, is happening there. Um, and then um, maybe conversely, migration as a, as a potential form of protection. Um, can it operate as a, as a protection measure, especially in the, in the current environment? Look, the, the, my, my perspective on prioritizing, it's perhaps a little different. Um, I think at the core of the problem of masculinity, coercion, and lack of solidarity is, is, is at the center of, of all this is the structure of inequality and inequity in the region. And from a prioritization point of view, particularly when it comes to foreign assistance, we have to re-engineer the development strategy to the region. And this is the, the perfect timing to re-engineer that. The approach, the, the economic development approach from uh, USAID, for example, has put a lot of focus on agriculture. Now, agriculture actually favors, for the most part, female, male labor. So that it's beginning the, from the, the from the start. You are setting a different. Uh, what's the the opposite of leveling playing field? You know, unbalanced playing field, in an inadequate playing field. Uh, within the context of female labor opportunities. The feminization of labor is another challenge. Um, so we do need to re-engineer uh, economic development in a way that you establish equal access to public and private services for men and females. And there you start from, um, from kids all the way to adults. This may sound a little abstract, but you know the, there is actually a lot of work on the right strategies to basically put into context the uh, programmable, uh, actionable projects that actually c can reduce inequality and inequity in the region. Um, with regards to, and that uh, that brings you to the issue of migration. In fact, you know, with with your question, um, when we look at the 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 study we did on the determinants of migration, there are three critical factors that explain migration. One is economic, the other one is transnational, and the other one is uh, victimization. Victimization is basically, I mean, um, in practical terms, um, those who want to migrate, at least 40% of them have been victim of some crime. Now, the type of crime most of the time is being robbed. About 20% of people who want to migrate actually have a relative or someone close who was killed. Um, but the, the, the most underlying factor that we found to be really at the core of these problems is the fact that um, people who make between $200 and $400, not under $200, not over $400, are more likely to migrate, are 70% more likely to migrate. Now, this is a, a, a broader trend because we're talking about more than 10 million. In Central America, we're talking about 10 million households. But when you're looking at the probability of migration among uh, people, it's about 2 million people who want to migrate this year. Of those, we have at least 600,000 who actually tried. Um, but within that context, the, inter the intersection between not being able to make ends meet because you're making a, an income that is basically just above the poverty line but not enough to generate wealth and being exposed to violence and having a relative in the United States um, has an effect on migrating. It's, it's a, it, the, the, the logical or the 
the rational decision making here is we look for safety and opportunity. And that's what the United States uh, offers. Um, that's where, you know, we are really, you know, we, we are not. Others are getting the, the point somewhere else for the wrong reasons on, on the policy perspective. But it, it gets back again to the issue of economics. We have to re-engineer the economic development strategy in a way that levels the playing field for male and females. And that starts uh, from kids. I mean, with uh, we had a project in, in Guatemala on after-school education dealing with children. And I mean, the, the extent of violence is, is just substantive. I and mean, it, it's the, the deprivation, the, the extent of economic and social and physical deprivation is just substantive in many ways. So it does have an effect on the possibility of migrating. So the, the programs have to look into how to level the playing field and rethink, you know, agriculture as a strategy for economic growth. Manuel, um, Daniela, you mentioned that um, Together for Girls continues to partner with the U.S. government. So can you tell us a little bit more about how that partnership works? And, um, you know, before I beat up too much on, on the Trump administration for cutting assistance to Central America, tell us what you were able to do um, with uh, working with the State Department. Yeah, so we work with the U.S. government... <clears throat> Among just getting over a cold, among various uh, with various agencies. So, with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, for example, they are the agency that has kind of developed this survey methodology I mentioned that has been done across the world. And so, they provided all of the technical assistance for the survey to be conducted in um, the three countries I mentioned: El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, in Latin America. Um, USAID helped fund that survey. Um, in all of those countries, um, understanding that, you know, there is an issue that's underlying kind of the broader, to your earlier point, you know, really thinking about the broader strategy and trying to understand how violence is part of that. Um, and then what happens is once we have the survey, then we move to, we, our model is called data to action. So once we have data, we move into action. So it's really working with local organizations, partners, governments, across sectors to figure out, okay, now that we have these data, you know, what does that mean for the country and how to implement those programs? And so, you know, you said you, you visited some programs that USAID has in Honduras. You know, I was recently in Honduras and El Salvador. Some of these programs continue. I mean, it's hard to say what's going to happen with the funding and the situation and the, the policy decisions that have been made. But I think you know, from my perspective, then as a partnership, we move towards how to use those data to inform programming. And right now that's happening, but it's, you know, it's all very tenuous at this point. Good. Um, uh, and Rachel, maybe just to, to finish up with you and then we'll open it up for, for questions. But on the, on the domestic side of U.S. policy, obviously KIND is on the front lines of uh, representing um, Children from Central America in, in immigration court. Um, there have been a number of changes, uh, to U.S. policy. A lot of those have been very visible around conditions of detention, family separation, the things we've seen in the news. Maybe what's less, um, uh, obvious to, to the broader public is some of the, the changes that have been made to asylum law, um, and the, um, uh, the premises on which, you know, asylum can be granted. And uh, I'm curious as to, you know, to the extent to which this is affecting um, Kind's ability to obtain protection for victims of uh, sexual and gender-based violence um, in the cases that you are you're litigating. Absolutely. So um, I'm actually not an attorney, and I'm not on Kind's U.S. domestic side, so I won't get into a lot of detail here. I'm actually on the Central America Mexico team, but there are many people who are attorneys that Kind who are working on the U.S. side. Who, um, if you have any specific questions or want to reach out about policy, would be really happy um, to share. We have a U.S. policy team that's working um, constantly to respond to all of the threats and all of the um, everything that's coming down the line in terms of limiting kids access to asylum and we're just really concerned about what we see as just the barrage of um, new rules new changes that are meant to limit the ability of children including survivors of sexual and gender-based violence to access protection in the United States um, and as we're talking about um, 
sort of the big, my big picture answer would be as we're talking about how to address root causes of, of forced migration, how to strengthen child protection in judicial systems, how to prevent violence. These are long-term projects, and they, they require investment, and we need to get started with them now. But in the meantime, children and families will continue to flee violence, will continue to seek protection in the United States and in Mexico. And these governments, absolutely, our government has a responsibility to provide per access to protection and due process to these children. Thanks for letting me put you on the spot, despite not being your, your ballywick. Um, and she knew the answer. Of course she did. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, we have about 15 minutes to uh, to open up for questions. So maybe we'll take three to start, and we'll come back with our panelists. And we have time. We'll uh, we'll come back for for more questions. So let me start right there. If you could introduce yourself, please. Hi. Hello. I'm Julia Silva, also Brazilian, and um, I am director of the Violence Prevention Office at the American Psychological Association. Um, so it's, um, I was very interested in your discussion about masculinity. I have two things to say. One is this. Um, the APA launched early this year the guidelines for, you know, mental health services to men. We were trashed by the right wings in this country because we called it the toxic masculinity concept and how you know, um, our members and mental health professionals should deal with this situation. So it's not easy, you know, when we wanted to discuss what is, what is this toxic masculinity doing to men. Um, another thing that um, I would like to share with you is um, the issue about the, the masculinity is power. So the issue is power. So, and this is very well um, modeled in our societies. So if you do not have a power, we are nothing. So if for a man not to have a power, it is a very difficult thing. What do we see about the gangs? And then we talk a lot about how does it happen that so many boys and men go into the, the gangs. And they are at the hands of the drug dealing. Nobody here is talking about that. But we know that this is the most important issue in our countries in Latin America, which is how the drug dealers and the cartels are taking over the institutions. Certo? Okay? So, if you not deal with that situation, it's not going to go. They are controlling the economy, they are controlling institutions, and they are controlling the culture. So, boys want to be part of that, because that will give them power. Respect is a very important thing for men. If we do not have respect at home, because, you know, parents are not prepared to deal with all the difficulties and challenges that is raising children in very difficult circumstances and contexts. And for these countries in low income, desperation, mental health issues, you know where to go. What is happening? Parents are, you know, hitting their kids. And what happens with the kids? I want to get power. I'm not being respected in my house. So the gangs will give them the respect. So how do we break that cycle? How all of us break that cycle that is a, you know, a machine to put the boys into this, you know, um, continuing of where can I get power? Where can I get respect? If you see any discussions about di social dynamics among gangs, it's fascinating. Just read the papers that our members publish and others. It's fascinating. And then you're going to understand, like I, you know, what Daniela was saying, also all the kind of data that we have about what is the dynamics that is so attractive to those boys and then to men to perpetuate this culture of power over those who don't, the kids and the women. So. Right. That is something that is very important for us Terrific. to Thanks. reach out. Let's go right, right behind here, and, uh, and then we'll come here in front. Hi. Um, I am Bolivian, but I live in Brazil. I have 20 years of research in this area. And, Daniela, I really like uh, the good news you, you, you give us. You gave us before uh, about data. But I think the challenges are uh, uh, we need high tuning, what I call high tuning in everything. You know, example, the enforcement of law. 
We have in Brazil the Maria da Peña slow. It's a great loop. It's a keystone for Brazil. But it doesn't have any impact in the in the in the in the in the women and girls. You don't have you have under registration about the bio, sexual violence in Brazil about the girls. I know we we are banned so much in Brazil, but we have a, this high to what I'm talking about. Today in the Brazilian Congress, we have a commission for the women's rights. They have 24 members, representatives of Brazil. 20 are male. Really, 20 are male. We are, we only have four women in, 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 in this. So when I say high tuning about data, and the last point that I want, maybe you can co comment about, uh, we did, we, we conduct a, a research in 2017 in all the main capitals in Brazil, Recife, Rio de Janeiro, and I am convinced that violence, sexual violence is totally intertwined with child labor in the case of, of the girls. In the case of the boys, it's uh, about a bio physical violence with, with child labor. And uh, I think those things, we need more data to work with that. And we, we need really more high tuning about the policies and about the, the, the things because the violence. And, 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 and one, one finding that we, 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 we have is that it was not income driving subject. It's not. In Brazil, in the Northeast, the problem is cultural. It really is not. The, the contribution of the girls to the income family, to the income household, it's only 1.7 percent. We, we find that in, in 2017. So maybe we can co comment here about these high tuning strategies we need in all this subject. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Very Brazil heavy today. Let's uh, let's take uh, these two comments and then we'll come back to our our panelists. Well, thank you. I think Daniela, you're putting things in perspective, timeline wise. Uh, as uh, violence prevention is a relatively new method, I would say maybe but in science, and uh, you were talking about 20 years, but in Central America, I think this started about maybe 11 years ago. Actually, I headed the first uh, USAID regional violence prevention project. There was no violence prevention projects per se back back then, 2007, 2008. So uh, uh, within this. 10 years, I would say there has been a huge amount of learning on behalf of everybody in the region, uh, civil society, uh, USAID uh, itself has learned a big deal, um, private sector, implementers, governments, everybody has learned a lot. There has been a lot happening. There's been heavy investment also. Um, I think we are at a point that people understand you know, uh, that there has been pilots that have been stepping up. The project you saw is probably our project, Proponte Mas. I started Proponte. It was a pilot of family, family based interventions uh, uh, that then was scaled up. But we did it with 100 families. And uh, I mean, you can see the risk reduction. It's very clear that we need to work with the family. I mean, everything points to that. But there's, you know, masculinity. You had the work also of Monica Salaquet from Nicaragua. It's been very, I mean, it's been done in prisons. It's been done around. It works. It works. I am a believer of, so, of, of changing social norms or changing culture. So uh, I think there's a lot there. It has to be scaled up, as you said. And now we have data, and that's extremely important, too. I think we had a question here in front, and then we'll have to stop there. Hi. Ooh, hello. My name is Jacqueline Tancredi. I'm with Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. Um, I'm not from, in my heart, in my heart, but not my, <laughs> um, but I, I just want to first thank you all. It's, it's very encouraging to hear everything that you're all doing. Um, I want to just, number one, I want to say that I think the, the systems approach, right? I know we talk about this as a, a fancy word now, a systems approach, but the concept of inspire is really critical to having any sort of impact 
anywhere, not just Central America or Latin America. If you do any research on ISIS and youth that are involved in extreme violence in the Middle East and you compare it with the violence and the, the organized crime and youth and violence in Central America, you will find it is very similar. And if we don't take that systems approach, it will not change. And that is directly linked to this idea of culture. And how do we have a cultural shift? How do we change mindset of men and women the same and in the same room? And so my question for you is, especially if we're talking about policy and if we're going to get backing from, let's say, the US government, we need to almost sell it to them in a way. We're going to reduce remigration. Well, how? You have to make these places safe. You have to invest in those places. So we propose it in a way where we can support entire communities and countries in being safe by addressing the entire system and taking the time and understanding that a cultural shift is needed and a balance between men and women. You have women that aren't coming forward. You have girls and children that are not going to be heard. So when we have conversations with men about toxic masculinity or we're teaching boys in school about why violence is bad, we also have to show them the added value of girls and women and children. And so my question is around how much time are we allotting to this cultural shift that needs to happen and how are we teaching, sharing, and exchanging ideas about the value of men and women and children all equally. So I think that will start to slowly move forward um, and help on all sides of the borders and all genders and all ages. Um, it's a tough question, but something to think about. Great. Um, well, uh, some terrific questions. Um, you each have two to three minutes to answer them all. Um, <laughs> so maybe we'll go in reverse order. Uh, Manuel, start with you and uh, work our way back. Yeah, six minutes, right? I, I think the, the short answer is precision, decision, and resources. Precision because of the issue of data. Uh, and you know, we talk about Central American violence and we associate it only to drugs. Um, well, actually, we gotta be more precise because the, there are differentiated trends when, when it comes to the, the effect of victimization on people in Central America. In Honduras, the role of uh, drug cartels is more pervasive in pushing people out. But in Guatemala, you have an ecosystem of violence that is of organized crime that is far, far more than just drug cartels. There are only seven drug cartels in Central America. They control the transshipment of 500 tons of cocaine but they don't necessarily have the same effect on violence as in every country. Same thing is in El Salvador, we know is um, the issue of, of uh, the youth gangs. So precision matters. The second aspect is decision. The decision makers, the e economic and political elites are the ones that still hold these very old fashioned notions of masculinity and power. And they are the ones that need to be problematized in their beliefs and their decisions on how to change policies. Otherwise, you, go, you don't go very far because what you do is that, um, unfortunately, with foreign assistance, for as good as it is, um, the NGOs do what the donor tells you to invest on. So the rationale, for example, of why to invest in early childhood education and not in strengthening primary schooling uh, it's mostly because we found out in Washington that the programs on early childhood ha are important and have an effect based on the industrialized world. But the, the, there is a, the, we need to look at the correspondence between needs and uh, wants. And the third issue of resources is that the, the, the type of uh, investment that is needed goes beyond public budgeting and goes beyond um, foreign assistance. I mean, $20 million in foreign assistance to education to Honduras, for example, is a drop of 
but then that's why you have to engage the private sector. And there are ways to engage the private sector without also creating conflicts and et cetera. But I think precision, decision, and resources are the way to answer your question. Um, and uh, you, you can have results, but challenging the status quo elites about their perceptions of masculinity and power is really fundamental. I mean, at the end of the day, for example, when, when Salvador started this program, and I'll finish here, um, the response of governments in Central America about violence was mano dura. Where did it come from? It came from the elites. And yes, the, the, the average population, even today, you do a survey, they say mano dura is the way to go. But if the elites change the mindsets, you do see changes. I mean, not, normative behavior takes time to change. It's not immediate, but it can be achieved. Uh, the experience of Nicaragua is an interesting one where democratic norms were adopted, were implemented, but then the new norm of repression would change uh, the status quo. Should I go next? I'm going to have to steal that. I love it. Deci precision, decision, and resources. That's perfect. Yes, I fully agree with that. And I want to add, and I want to say yes to everything everyone said, and obrigada. Thank you to my Brazilian fellows. I promise I didn't <laughs> coerce anyone to come here today. Um, the, the <laughs> um, you know, for me, in addition to what you said, Manuel, I want to just go back to the point you made. You know. I've been working on violence prevention and response for over 20 years, and sometimes it can be pretty frustrating and, <laughs> and lonely, um, but it's really helpful for me to take that step back and to kind of see the big picture. These are, these are, you know, in our lifetimes kind of, this isn't something that we're going to see changes in in a year or five, you know, it's, it's, this is a lifetime journey, but I think a really important one. And we've seen, we have seen things change in so many places, and so it is possible. I think, we are a nascent field, and I think what's happened to date is when you, and I come from the field of violence against women as well, violence against children. This is, you know, I've been working on all these issues. Um, we spent a lot of time over the last 20 years, 10 years especially, documenting the magnitude of the problem, understanding, and I'm not just talking about together, I'm talking about all of us as a field, really looking at this understanding and beginning to test interventions here and there. What works? If you do this, what has more of an impact, etc.? And so the stories so far, I think that we've created, the narrative that we've created globally when it comes to violence prevention is, it's bad. We know it's bad. We have all these data sources from all kinds of places that show you how bad it is. And we have to shift to, it's bad and it doesn't have to be this way. We know that there are things that can be done that can actually prevent violence from happening. Um, we did a recent study about not was two years ago with this group called the Fuller Project and, and a few others looking at coverage of media around violence against women and children globally, um, and particularly focused in the US and Europe. So it's a developed, you know, kind of country focus. But what we found is 98% of the stories in the news are about something bad happened. Something bad happened. Or maybe, you know, something bad happened and someone is going to trial or someone is being looked for. Less than 2% talk about prevention, about what you can do, about interventions, about the kinds of action that you can take to prevent that violence from happening. So I think as a global community, beginning to shift that narrative to it's bad, it doesn't have to be this way, and everyone has a role to play. I'm often in, in a lot of conversations where people say, no, it's families, it's governments, it's it's norms, it's, and what Inspire tells us is it's all of it. It's all of it. And yeah, in some places you have to start with one and then head to the other. Of, of course you have to prioritize, but part of how we're gonna change this is more of this multi-sectoral comprehensive approach and everyone has a role to play. And I think um, then it gets us to that point you made, Manuel, about resources. And I just, I think it's important to say this because this isn't just true for Central America. But it's, let's start there. The amount of resources spent, whether it's by the U.S. government, by other donors, by the governments in these countries, on violence prevention and response, the kinds of change that has to happen, is woefully inadequate. And that is true globally. That is true in this country, 
that is true across the world in terms of the magnitude of this epidemic and then the kinds of you know response that we have to deal with it. And so I think that's kind of the next step is how do we really push to, to, to actually act instead of be paralyzed by how bad the situation is. Oh. I really appreciate the positive perspective in terms of what we what we are doing and what we can do to create systemic change, change norms, prevent violence. Um, and I would just add, and this has been mentioned, but the importance of engaging uh, men and boys and entire communities and families in violence prevention work, and also the need for a much greater investment of resources from all sides as well. Um, and I would also just mention in terms of the conversation about power, um, I, I, I agree with the analysis completely and also we see the infiltration of uh, gangs and other organized criminal groups in governments, in institutions, in the fact that survivors of violence can't go and safely report violence because of the involvement of um, police, of judicial officials, of, of different actors um, with organized criminal groups that puts people at such risk if they seek protection and seek to report violence. Um, and in terms of the power of, of gangs and other groups, the only thing I would add is um, in agreeing entirely with, with your analysis that we've seen talking to boys and young men um, who have migrated to the US and then also in Central America, um, really that uh, these young people are seeing the impact of gangs in their own communities, the negative impact, the violence, and most of them want nothing to do with it and are really looking for alternatives and are really um, looking to or be subject to forced recruitment um, and other forms of violence and are really looking for how they can create a uh, future for themselves without involvement in gangs and they're not they're not getting help they're not getting protection they don't have options and that's when we see them flee that's when we see them migrate so really thinking about how do we create options for both boys and girls in these communities who are looking for um, ways to stay safe and and build a future without involvement in these groups great uh, thank you Rachel thank you all for a terrific conversation um, I know we've just scratched the surface. Clearly, we need to do this again in Rio. Um, but, um, but, but, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully, um, we've also shed a bit of insight and and uh, and pointed the way forward uh, on on some of these uh, some of these challenges. So, um, I want to thank our colleagues Laura Porras and Irene Stefania for their support with this event. Um, Thank you uh, to Rachel and Daniela, our guests, and thank you, Manuel, uh, for your contributions. Thank you all for being here, and please uh, join me in um, congratulating and, and commending and thanking our panelists.